Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, because of the hard work of Sarah and her col colleague Bill Holstein, we have a record crowd tonight, and I'd like to thank you all for being here and supporting the Overseas Press Club. We're actually thrilled that you're here. Um, we're eagerly looking forward to an address tonight from Jeff Zucker, CNN. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to hear your remarks. Be sure to look at the new edition of Dateline, which is on everyone's chairs. Uh, besides great journalism, both written and visual, the magazine has a complete list of winners and honorees, so you can follow along in our program. Kudos to Michael Serrell, Bob Nicholsberg, and Vera Naughton for producing it and putting it all together. Competition for the annual awards this year was especially fierce. We had some 430 entries, uh, which were evaluated by 90 volunteer judges who dedicated a lot of time and effort to coming up with the winners who are all here tonight, I hope. Scott Kraft led that effort. Well done, Scott. Hearty congratulations to all the winners. So on a serious note, I'd like to point out, as you all know, that we're gathering at a difficult time for global media. Violent and frequently deadly attacks on journalists are on the rise. Censorship is being enabled by new, sophisticated technologies. Governments around the world increasingly attempt to control or suppress the flow of information by whatever means they can muster, from shutting down access to, to, access to imprisoning journalists at will. Two nights from now, rather than attending the White House Correspondents' Dinner, our own president is scheduled to break tradition and host a rally in Pennsylvania, where he may again lather up the crowd by excoriating the media. Of course, this is his prerogative in a country where speech is not stifled. But tonight it is our turn to be vocal. Not loud, just vocal. To forcefully assert that the robust and free press envisioned by America's founders will not be shouted down by pandering politicians or diminished by tweets in the night. One way to exclaim our solidarity in the pursuit of truth is to honor those who have fallen while trying to bring light to a singularly dark place. Of the many honors that come with the presidency of the Overseas Press Club is the privilege of bestowing the President's Award. This year, in recognition of the environment in which we are working, I have chosen to give the award not to an individual, but to a group of journalists. This is not unprecedented. In 1968, the quote, newsmen of Czechoslovakia were recognized. In 2007, the award honored reporters injured covering the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. This year, the President's Award goes to our colleagues who have died covering the six-year war in Syria. Our friends at the Committee to Protect Journalists say this number totals 108, more journalists than were killed during the 20-year Vietnam War. With this award, we honor their courage and the sacrifice they made to report on one of the 21st century's ongoing atrocities. Let's please acknowledge them with our applause. We have a tradition at this awards dinner of lighting a candle to recognize journalists who, are killed, who have been killed are imprisoned or are missing. Tonight, we'd offer, like to offer this flame of hope to the more than 80, that's 80, journalists currently imprisoned by the government of Turkey. Today, more journalists are jailed around the world than at any time since CPJ began keeping detailed records in 1990. Turkey accounts for nearly one third of the global total. To recognize our colleagues being held against their will, particularly those in Turkey, Hamid Balici will light our candle. Hamid, will you join me? <laughs> Hamid was the last editor-in-chief of the Zaman Daily before the Erdogan, Erdogan regime forcibly shut down the paper in March of 2016. Mr. Balici has a few words he'd like to say. Good evening, my colleagues and everyone here. 
I am the editor-in-chief of the largest newspaper in Turkey, which has been shut down last year, and I had to flee the country to escape myself, but I'm here uh, to ask your solidarity and your support to my friends who are more than 150 still in jails of Turkey. And unfortunately, it is an ally of United States for last 60 years, but now turned down in terms of any standards of democracy. And personally, I lost my career and my job and my everything. I'm a, a journalist for 25 years, and uh, I try to start life from scratch here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. If anyone has a job for Mr. Balichi, I think he'd be a for it. <laughs> We'll observe a moment of silence for, in honor of our colleagues. Thank you. Um, I'll return later to talk to you about some of the OPC's latest initiatives. I suggest you, um, if you are willing, that you share photos tonight with your friends using the hashtag OPC Awards Dinner 78. I think that's coming up on the screen, uh, or not. <laughs> yes, there it is. Um, and now, please welcome Bill Holstein, a past, past president of the OPC and a member of the OPC Foundation. Bill? Nope. <laughs> you restore my remarks. Well, that was awkward. <laughs> we lost a hero this past year, a real hero in my mind. Roy Rowan did it all and did it in style. <laughs> After World War II, uh, he couldn't get a job in journalism, so he drove UN relief convoys in China, taking gunfire from both nationalists and the communists. When that got too dangerous, he quit and sought to drown his sorrows in a bar on the Bund in Shanghai. A lot of us did. That's where he met the Time Life correspondent, Bill Gray, who hired him and launched his career, even though Columbia Journalism School would never accept him, which Roy loved to point out. Roy was there in China, where he could see that Chiang Kai-shek's forces were crumbling, even though Chiang personally told Roy that he was winning the war. This picture of him, do we have it up? No. Uh, Roy was there in the fall of Shanghai. Roy was there on the banks of the Yalu River in the depths of winter when Chinese troops trudged through the ice to enter the Korean War. He could see the footprints of the Chinese soldiers in the snow. Roy was there in Saigon when it was falling and was on one of the last flights out. And unlike the correspondents we all know with broken lives, we shan't, we shan't name any of them, Roy had a story, storybook romance with Helen. He, he, he proposed to her on a telephone from Germany, and she got on the plane in New York and flew off to be married. They had four sons together, including Marcus Rowan, who has a table here this evening, for which we are grateful. <laughs> Roy obviously believed in the cause of international journalism. He believed that correspondents should bear first witness to history. And Roy believed in the OPC. He was once our president, and he raised funds to endow a scholarship in his name at the OPC Foundation. He taught me a personal lesson, and I think all of us, to never give up on the things you believe in, to race right up to the edge of death at full speed. Here's a musical tribute to Roy from
from James Valenti, a family friend, accompanied by Dr. Kelly Iche Lin on piano. Hello, everyone. I'm honored to be here tonight. I'm going to sing a very short and passionate piece, and I just thought I'd tell you briefly what it's about so you can enjoy it even more. Uh, my character is about to be sentenced to death, and uh, he knows in this moment, and he's thinking about his beloved. He's thinking of her sweet kisses and her tender caresses, <clears throat> and he says, the hour of death is near, and I have never loved life more than I do right now. <clears throat> Van le stelle, e dolcezza la terra, stride all'uscio dell'orto, e un passo sfiorava l'arena. La fragrante mi cade fra le braccia Tanto la vita, tanto 